So a lot of things happened in 1973, and they were great in 1973, <laughs> and they're really depressing Uh-oh. to think about now. Oh. Um, and one of those things that happened in 1973 was that in New York City, the World Trade Center opened to great fanfare Ooh. in 1973. Um, the World Trade Center, which a lot of people don't realize is actually a complex of seven buildings. Mm-hmm. Uh, World Trade Center 1 and 2 were, past tense, sorry everybody, the iconic Twin Towers, uh, which a lot of New Yorkers didn't like when the World Trade Center opened because I'm sure. I'm they sure eclipsed they have, like, the Empire State it. Building, uh-huh. you know, being the largest uh-huh. building in New York and kind of, you know, they thought it fucked up the skyline and they were too boxy or whatever. Um, now it's so interesting. You see a movie that was made in the late 90s and any movie that was shot in New York in the late 90s, they always do an establishing shot of the skyline to say, hey, we're in New York and there are the Twin Towers. <laughs> and it's just like, oh. Um, at the time of their completion, uh, the towers, again, were the tallest buildings, not only in New York, but in the world. They were 1,362 feet high. That's crazy. Yeah. I've never been uh, in that. Well, I won't go, obviously, now, but I had never been in the World Trade Center, even when it was around. I don't know. Well, I've been to the new one, which is even taller. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, I've been to the Oculus and like all that stuff. And, but yeah. I have not been, I was not, I had never gone to the old ones. I never, never had either. And why would no. you? Because they were basically, they were big office buildings. Yeah. I mean, they did have, you know, the, uh, the kind of, was it like a rotating restaurant? I think it was a revolving restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, which is kind of cool, but it's like, it was, it was an office complex yeah. and it was 13.4 million square feet of office space were contained. <laughs> So crazy. Uh, in all of those levels of the Twin Towers and the rest of uh, the World Trade Center. Uh, this is an office complex that could accommodate 130,000 people. That's more than cities anywhere else. In, I mean, in a lot of areas in the yeah. country. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, and a Tulsa. lot of people, <laughs> yes. And a lot of people who worked at the World Trade Center did not live in New York. So, I mean, it was, yep. you know, they crossed the river and they and they came on over. Um, of course, you know, the reason why this is depressing is because the World Trade Center was destroyed by terrorists on September 11th, 2001. Um, there is now a new World Trade Center uh, in New York City. It contains six buildings, um, also a museum and a memorial. Um, and I've been to that and it's yeah, very moving. Same. Um, it's lovely. Yeah, I actually just went to, speaking of similar type of memorials, I just went to the Oklahoma City bombing memorial. Um, and they also have a museum and they have, a, it's sort of obviously on a less grand scale, but kind of like a reflecting pool and, you know, stone. And it was very well done. I will highly recommend if you're ever in Oklahoma City. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make the trip. Come yeah. on out. It was, I, I was shocked how, how well the museum is done. It is as good as the Book Depository Museum in Dallas, which I think is the top, top museum. Okay. Anyone been to the museum on Broadway to lighten things up a little bit uh, in New York? Yet? Um, Not yet, no. All right. Well, that's my next That's my next tourist trap destination next time I go to New York City. Um, I hear it's really well done. Yeah. I, I heard it's a total tourist trap, but so much fun. I mean, look, I've been, I went to Madame Tussauds in London when I went there for the first time, so oh, I'm not absolutely. I'm not opposed to tourists. Absolutely. No, Madame Tussauds is like, you know, yeah, we had to lighten this up somehow. Yeah, wax figurines are just, you know, yeah. hilarious. <laughs> oh, the tape pours downstairs. You know, when they're done them. well, they're great, and when they're done yeah. badly, they're even better, because that's they're just hilarious. They're amazing. Yeah, yeah, the one of, um, the one of Kamala Harris is, is particularly so uh, bad. odious. <laughs> oh, Matt, if you Kamala. haven't seen it, you need to like Google that because it looks nothing like her. Oh. It looks like it doesn't even look like a relative of hers. <laughs> yes, she should sue. That is a that is a. That is I a said she looks like up. Rob Lowe in a wig. <laughs> oh God! Oh. <laughs> Welcome to the Rewind Project, where Allie, Matt, and Eric take another look at your favorite milestone movies through the lens of our present day. Will it be a skip, rent, or buy? Stay tuned and find out. Hello, hello. We are deep, deep into 1973 at this point. Um, and 1973, we are in you. We are in you deep. Um, and today... We are going to be talking about Soylent Green. Um, I had never seen this movie before. We watched it for this. I've always wanted to, so I was glad that I sort of was able to choose this one. Um, yeah, it was a real wild ride. 
It was, I had, I really, other than the famous line, which we'll talk about in a second, I didn't know anything about that. I mean, I knew it was sort of dystopian. I knew it was, you know, America in the future. But like all of the details of this movie, did not know anything about them. I did not either. I watched the trailer before I watched the movie just because it was there as I was streaming. And the first thing is, it's 50 years into the future. It's 2022. And I'm like, wow, it looks a whole lot like the 70s. I'm going to tell you that in terms of just, you know, fashion, hairstyles, uh, the general, you know, look and mood of the thing. You know, we haven't changed a whole lot since the 70s, apparently. Yeah, no, no, there's a lot to we'll get into that but there's a lot to be said about actual 2022 and what is what is uh what they got correct (laughs) um so uh this was a uh book that was turned into a screenplay so this was based on the novel make room make room exclamation Exclamation point exclamation point yes those are actually in it i'm not having a seizure uh that is a 1966 novel by harry harrison that's quite a name we sure. talked on our lap, last episode about good names. That's a that's a good uh, that's a good author name. Uh, the screenplay was written by Stanley R. Greenberg, and the movie was directed by Richard Fleischer. Okay, I have not heard of any of those people ever. No, they. You know what? They sound like a bunch of old white men. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so some notable achievements. I mean, no, nothing big here, folks. But I did find a couple. Um, it was best film script of the year for the Nebula Award, which is Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Both Stanley Greenberg and Harry Harrison contributed, I guess, contributed to the screenplay, or they both got, uh, win- they both won because one wrote the novel and one. And I know Harry Harrison like came to the set and stuff, but he was a little, uh, he was a little upset about a lot of the changes that the movie made. But you know what? That's a tale as little as time. I feel mm-hmm. like novelists almost are never like super happy about the movie adaptations. Well, so. since I got into fiction writing myself, it is such a, cause I used to write for theater. I never really wrote a screenplay cause I'd always just felt like, I don't know, I'm writing a screenplay. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like you're never going to, if you're not connected in that industry, you're never going to sell your screenplay. Um, or at least I didn't feel like I would, but, but I was writing for theater and I got some plays produced. Writing narrative fiction is a completely different animal, like completely. And it's so interior, the way that you have to write. And there's so much stuff that that you can do in novels that you cannot do on film. I mean, just the way that people think and just kind of describing someone's interior landscape, that unless you have like a brilliant actor who can do it all with their eyes while they're in close up, you just can't, you know, it's it's very, so I really admire people who can adapt novels well to film. I mean, it really is a huge talent. And, and you know, a lot of people say that, that the best uh, adaptations to film mostly came from kind of crappy novels. Like, no one really reads Mario Puzo's The Godfather, but, like, it's one of the best movies ever made. Well, and I think, too, and I, I'm sure that you can speak to this, Eric, is that, you know, uh, writing a novel, you probably put a lot of yourself into it too. And it's probably, you probably take it a little, you would take it a little personally if things were changed in the novel that you very lovingly, laboriously poured out yourself over too. I so I think that's hope, some of it. I mean, you know, my mouth to God's ear, someone wants to take something that I wrote and put it on film and give me the residuals. Like, you know, please. Call sure. Me. Like, <laughs> I would hope though that I would be, pretty understanding having also written plays like and knowing what works in one and what does not work in the other. I think if something truly just did not work, like you couldn't put it on film. Well, I would go, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not all novelists are assholes about it. I I think it's, you're right. It's kind of a cliche that, that people who write books like really don't like it when Hollywood fucks them up. But most of the time, the folks in Hollywood, this is my completely un- uh, researched opinion. Most of the time, these adapters know what they're doing. I agree. Um, it, you know, I mean, I think I almost always love the book more than the movie, but sometimes, not always, but sometimes I like to see what they can do with the book. And I think that they, you know, I've not read the novel that this is based on, but they definitely, the movie's a little bit more bombastic, I think. And occasionally they do it brilliantly. I mean, I didn't think anybody could make a movie out of the hours. It was just so interior. I mean, entire chapters were were written about 
that a, book. A Ooh. cake that couldn't get made well. And da, da, da. oh, I love that book. But I just did not think they could make a movie out of it. And I thought the movie was brilliant. Yeah, I have really enjoyed that movie. The movie was definitely, I read the book and I saw the movie and the movie was definitely better. That, you know, I, those sorts of types of books are just not, they're not my, they're not my genre. <laughs> um, and then, okay, so we're going to spoil something for you, but this was all spoiled for us before we even watched the movie. This has been spoiled for us for many, many, many years. Uh, the phrase, soil it green as people, is ranked 77 on AFI's list of 100 years, 100 movie quotes. It's the only thing I knew about this movie. So Soylent Green not... is people! As people. As people! I mean, that's all <laughs> I knew. And so I feel like, you know, I I have to say, this movie was a bit of a chore for me. And, and maybe had I not known, and I'd seen this in the theater in 1973, when you find out, because it's not, the, the, the central mystery of the movie is not what is Soylent Green made out of. No. You know, the, the central mystery is why'd they kill Joseph Cotton? Like, first of all, why'd they cast, like, film legend Joseph Cotton for a, a role that was only, like, five minutes long? Um, that's mystery number one. Uh, number two is why did they kill this man? You know, and so that's what the whole thing is built on. So you're expecting some big government secret. But the idea that they've been feeding the population dead people is not, like, anything that you're that you would be prepared for unless this movie had been spoiled for you a million years ago, like it had for me. I feel like the revelation of that would have been much more dramatic for me as if I didn't like know going in that Soylent Green was people. So I'm a little mad at everyone who's spoiled this movie. Like I, I, didn't the Simpsons even? Oh yeah. I feel like they did an episode like this. Everyone knows that line. (laughs) Um, and if you didn't, sorry, but you know, you should, because hello, have you even been awake? Like every, you know, one of those the greatest people. The thing I love about that list is it's like the American Film Institute is like, well, it's not a great movie, so I can't put you on the hundred best movies, but we'll create a list for you so that we can say, Hey, we think about this movie. That's what that list says to me. Well, and it's only 77. I mean, there are 76 more iconic lines from films. Um, I'll have what she's it, having. But it yeah. made a listicle. <laughs> made a list. It made a list. You know, his number, I'm sure his... I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse is probably way up there. Way up there. <laughs> yes. So if somebody would like to look at that list and let us know what number one is, I don't feel like clicking. Um, I didn't even. I didn't even link it. Um, and it is, you know, the second and only, second of two notable achievements for Smiling Green. <laughs> That's it. Um, the plot. The other thing I would say, it is the last film of Edward G. Robinson, which is kind of yeah. We're I gonna think that's get a big deal. yeah. We're gonna get all into that because it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, the plot: a nightmarish futuristic fantasy about the controlling power of big corporations, hmm, and an innocent cop who stumbles on the truth. Innocent. <laughs> I, I have problems with that word, innocent. I Robert mean, Thorne you know, is. I a, mean, innocent from dick. the like eating people, he is but trash. he's definitely not. He's he definitely is not trash. Innocent. Well, and it's really only a nightmare unless you are like the one percent. So, like oh, Jeff yeah, Bezos would have been it's fine. Twenty twenty three too. Welcome yeah. to twenty twenty three. Yeah, <laughs> playing asteroid in your mid century modern apartment in Chelsea. Yeah, like. Also, okay. you know what? If you're the one percent, you're also good in twenty twenty three, and everybody yeah. else. Thank you. Oh well, be poor. And- uh, all right, this, let me get it. Let's get into this cast. So, my boy, my love, Charlton Heston. I will always find him attractive. I even found him attractive in this movie, even though this movie is very sweaty. It's you know, I like to. I always feel that I, I hone in on the movies that are very sweaty for some reason, or like the TV shows. Like Bloodline is a very sweaty TV show, and this is a very sweaty movie. But Charlton Heston, even though he's you know working his way to upper middle age in this movie, I still found him attractive. I would have slept with him too. Sorry. Ugh. Okay. Yeah. I, I this know. is the first time oh. I am verging in a big way from our hotness correspondent. Because <laughs> yeah, absolutely I don't know. not. The chokehold that, that Charlton Heston have, has over me. I mean, it was just, I don't know what it is, but yes. I mean, there were definitely times where I was like, mm, but there were definitely more times where I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Went from mm to mm. To mm. <laughs> Um, you're sweaty but you're wearing an ascot so that's okay (laughs) that wasn't an ascot it was a sweat rag that he would wrap right around his neck again i know i know um 
I mean, I thought he was good in this movie. I, in fact, when I was reading some of the reviews from 1973, a lot of them did remark that this was a little bit of a departure from his normal characters. Like he, he wasn't quite as, I don't know, arch <laughs> as he can get. The thing I liked about him is he seemed like a believable real person in this movie. Like he was an average guy again, cause I didn't find him very attractive. So I thought it was interesting that they are making the lead of this film. Just an average Joe that is trying to, you know, do his job. And, that, and I really kind of connected with him on that level. He views the furniture in that one scene. I was just like, really? She's just going to, I guess she has to. That just made me Yeah, cool. ew, ew, but, ew, <laughs> ew, trash. Because I, I would not have jumped in bed with him without <laughs> without somebody having to force me. So, <laughs> <laughs> Or without a shower, at least. Without I know. a shower. Can you imagine yes. how that smelled? Oh. Would you like a lovely shower? We have cakes of soap for exactly. you. Exactly. Big yeah. cakes of soap. <laughs> yeah. But I really did like him in this movie. I thought he he really propelled the film. I was it was I enjoyed the performance. I'm trying to I'm really trying to divorce my feelings about Charlton Heston as a person uh, from his you know performance as an actor. You know, taking the gun away from his cold dead hand, etc. Sure, um, which I I did not enjoy uh, that moment. Um, I don't have anything bad to say about his performance, but I did not like this character. This character was just a trash human being, um, mostly because of the way he treated the furniture, which we'll get to. Ugh. I mean, we're supposed yeah. to believe that's a big love story. And his his pickup line, his his seduction scene on the bed. That's what he says to her. And she starts taking off her clothes and sitting on the bed. Ew. I mean, that's just that 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 shit did not age well at all. I was I was aghast that I was watching this thing. And, and we're supposed to believe that poor Cheryl now has feelings for him after this encounter. Ew. I mean, just, yeah, everything about that was just awful. I wonder if Cheryl developed feelings for him because he treated her, well, not, he treated her poorly, but at the same time, he talked to her like a person. And seem to try to connect with her. Okay, I that don't. Is such a low I, bar. I mean, yeah, it is right. a low. I mean, well, of but, course, it's a low bar. I mean, she's the fucking furniture. Like, but, exactly. I mean, in comparison to the guy who comes at the end, the new tenant, who's mm-hmm. basically like, "I want to bring my buddies over, and we're gonna have a good time." Yes. Yeah. That was you know. that was equally uh, that was that was not worse. even equally that, yeah. was that was worse. But Charlton Heston did not treat her as well as we're led to believe that Joseph Cotton treated her. Like she's had it better than. On the bed. Ugh. Yeah. I, I, I don't disagree with you there. Yeah. The, the, the quote unquote romance that, that blossomed between them was very confusing. And but yes, I, he's not technically a client, but that's like police brutality. I mean, I was looking at this like, this is a police officer raping a citizen who has no choice but to go along. That's what that was. I mean, I just, and I, you know, I hate to sound like the purity police, but it's just like that shit was real ugly to watch in 2023. But I think they were also trying to say like how bad the future had gotten. Cause like, even as he was walking around, he was just collecting stuff. He was basically a thief. Oh yeah. I mean, I would do that. If I was in his position, I definitely would take all that shit. (laughs) I would too, because that to me was relatable. And that like you're taking from the 1% who don't deserve all this shit. Correct. You know, and like uh, if a green onion is going to make Edward G. Robinson that happy, then yeah, take the onion out of the fridge before it spoils like that. But you know, that and, and raping a powerless woman, not the same thing. And so that was just like, ew. I mean, I just, all I'm saying is, From that moment on, I hated the character, didn't care what happened to him, didn't care if he suffered, didn't care if he got shot through the head. I didn't care. Like, it it just, and and I know, product of its time, blah, 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 I could not follow, you say he, you know, he propelled the movie forward, I did not want to follow him anywhere, and I was mad that I had to. It was a poor choice for the character so i can see <laughs> yes i i can see why you would not why you at that moment you'd be like nah, i don't like you anymore <laughs> i mean i was able to disassociate maybe that i don't know what that says about me but <laughs> enough to at least you know 
follow him uh, along. I found the moment unbelievable, but then I thought, as I was like, as we were watching, I was like, okay, so she really just is property and part of the apartment. Is yeah. It? So the, which to me just kind of said what the future was like. And so and the fact that I, he yes. took advantage of it says something about him. And that's, which is problematic. Yes. Yeah. And, and I do think that what the movie was trying to do is saying, look at how misogynistic the future is. Like mm-hmm. they were definitely trying to make that point, but they had this hero cop that they totally built up as a hero who takes advantage of that part of the awfulness of the future. And then, and all the other girls are in the next room. Okay. So tacky Chuck, super, not only rapey, tacky, but then he comes out and the the pimp is like beating all the girls up and he saves them all. And I'm like, oh, now you're a hero. You just raped Cheryl. So I don't need any of your like virtue signaling bullshit. Like I was just, I was over him. So anyway, that don't need to dwell on that anymore. But I was not happy with Mr. Thorne. <laughs> Fair. I mean, I just thought it all sucked. <laughs> like all yeah. of the people, you know, like there was no, there's no good really in any for anybody unfortunately except you know mr cotton and his and his ilk um are right, moving on to the fabulous edward g robinson as saul roth um whom we saw way way back in double indemnity who i know is dathan and the ten commandments because i love that fucking movie um and i love that edward g robinson and charlton has were besties um this was as you said before eric uh edward g robinson's last movie um in fact his last scene was his actual death scene in the movie um it's his last scene ever so kind of prescient but uh, Charlton Heston spoke, you know, gave a eulogy at his funeral, and by all accounts, they were BFFs. So I thought that was cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ever G. Robinson can uplift just about anything. Every scene that he was in, I was suddenly back into this movie, and I really, and, and as much as I did not like Robert Thorne, I really liked Saul, the character. Um, I loved how poetic he could get about a fucking onion. Um, and and that really just kind of was like, holy shit, we are living in a nightmare. Like when you mm-hmm. get that, you know, and, and he took it completely seriously, played it totally straight. And uh, yeah, he was fantastic. To me, his was no question the best performance in this, in this movie. He's always so good. And I, I just, what really struck me is that, you know, you open, you open this movie and it's, um, you know, they're this sort of this dilapidated apartment. You know, it doesn't have a lot of amenities. Um, but then you go outside and you see the people like sleeping in the stairwell and obviously sleeping outside. And you're like, oh, so these these gentlemen are actually doing like OK for themselves. Yes. <laughs> and it, it, that was cra- That was a really good reveal to me because I was like, oh, God, you know, they're living in this, you know, run down apartment building. And then you they pan over and I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Like, yeah, and I I did okay. appreciate the way that they revealed that. They didn't hit you over the head with it. They just uh-uh. showed him, you know, all the gymnastics he had to do to yes. get down the fucking stairs. <laughs> You're right. Could, can we talk about that for a second? Could you pick a more uncomfortable place to, like, take a nap? Like, everybody is all on all the stairs. It's like a cat. Like, they can just lay down and sleep anywhere. It was really, really weird to me. Like, find a horizontal surface. Like, one without a lot of bumps in it so you can actually just lay down and go to sleep. It was so weird. Okay, we don't need to revisit my entire college career, but I have slept on the stairs. So <laughs> um, and it's doable. Um, so I'll say that. But I also think that that's the point. All the horizontal surfaces were taken. Like, that's how overrun oh, That's what they populated. had left. That's what they had left. They got the short So these the were stick. the worst of the worst right yes. there, as they were living in the sleep. I don't know. I think that the church was pretty bad, too. But oh. we'll get to that. <laughs> um, all right. Anything else about... Mr. Robinson, here's Just, to you. We love him. All right, here's to you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Cheryl. Last name, the furniture. Lee Taylor Young played her. I thought it was an in- as, okay. Furniture aside, I thought she was an interesting character because she was sort of. You got a little deeper on, you know, her life and the fact that she stayed with the apartment. And I thought it was really interesting, too, when Charlton Heston asked her at the beginning, are you, do you come with the apartment or are you personal? So I guess people could have, like, companions Uh or they could have something that came with the apartment. Yes. 
Hence so there were levels. Called, there were levels of furniture, is what I'm saying. Yes, hence why they called you know the women the furniture, and not all women were furniture. That was a job, but all the women in this movie were furniture. They were all mm-hmm. prostitutes. Right. Yep. Not a single woman had a speaking role except for the nameless woman who was like, they only gave me a quarter of a kilo. She's the only <laughs> person who's female in this movie who spoke who wasn't a prostitute, which again tells me a little something about Mr. Harrison and, you know, maybe how he sees women. So again, yuck. Did we even see a, we did see a nun, didn't we, in the church? I can't even Yes, remember. I think we did. We did. Okay. Yes. But that was really about it. Yeah, no women on the police no force in 2022. Madonna or whore. Those were your choices. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or lady in a schmata, you know, right. on the street <laughs> bitching about not getting enough soil. That's me. Um, that's me in, in, the, in the alternate 2022. <laughs> that's, that's me. <laughs> but no women on the police force in 2022. No. Mm-mm. And not probably oh. not in 1973 either. So or Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's like... Yeah. While they got some things crazily right about 2022, face masks, you know, etc., um, they got a whole lot really, really wrong. Um, speaking of Cheryl, the state of video game technology in 2022 apparently really sucked. <laughs> that <laughs> that oh, fucking game of fact. Asteroid. I have a fun fact about that. <laughs> and you needed an entire cabinet to run it. Yeah. Yes. They, yeah. Yes. They, <laughs> but. To, I, the other thing I would say about that is it seemed like technology itself was just breaking down. Like there was nobody intelligent enough to actually repair things and it was hard to get things manufactured and repaired. I think it was they were spending all of their technology on figuring out how to feed people is really what it seemed like. And, you know, so like that's where all the brain power and, you know, and resources were going to at that time. Yeah, so but I that might have been why... the 1% to very much take care of themselves. You know, and I think sure. it, to me, it was just a failure of imagination. It wasn't, I don't think the, the the really shitty video game console was meant to be, you know, oh, look, even the 1% are suffering. No, that was just, they couldn't, they couldn't imagine virtual reality. So they didn't do goggles, which they absolutely could have filmed goggles and somebody playing a, you know, very futuristic game of paddle ball or something. But I, well, I don't, I mean, it would have been hard. You could have had somebody in the goggles, but you probably would not have been, you would. It would have been weird to show what they were showing. And sure, it but you wouldn't have had too to. Much That's the thing. Time. In 73, you wouldn't have had that technology anyway, but you could have done something that did not exist in 73. Um, yeah. Anyway, that video game made Cheryl me laugh. seemed happy. I'm just saying. She seemed very happy with it, but it made me laugh because this is supposed to be like, you know, the apex of, you know, modern home entertainment. And it is the shittiest looking game of Asteroid I've ever seen. <laughs> It's not even an Atari 2600 where you can change the game. Nope. You can't even. But I didn't. I, I That was, I, I blinked at it and then I was like, and then I forgot all about the video game uh, until I was researching fun facts. Um, all right. Next up is Chuck Connors as Tab Fielding, the henchman. Dun, dun. He kind of looked like a henchman. Like as yeah, you know. he he was he very well cast as a bad dude because I hated him on sight. Something about his face just pissed me off. He did have I a punch- punchable face. He generally plays characters like that, doesn't he? I feel like that's mostly what he does. I feel well, like I've seen him in a character like that before. They did keep us guessing for a little while. You know, it was like, is he bad? Is he bad? Is he not bad? Is he is he good? Is he you know? So, but then obviously, you know, he's he's pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, he was nice the henchmen to are the henchmen nice are not really bad. They're just doing what their bosses tell them, and they don't Correct. have a conscience about it. So, well, Correct. unless you go behind their back and have them assassinated, that's maybe bad. Spoiler. Right. <laughs> um, up next is Brock Peters as Chief Hatcher, the chief of the police. Brock Peters from one of my favorite movies ever made. Brock Peters was Tom Robinson in To Kill a Mockingbird. The man who was unjustly accused of raping Mayella. Um, Yes, he is wonderful in To Kill a Mockingbird. And he's so different here that I was like, wow, Brock Peters. Like, you're you're an actor. Wow. (laughs) Like, really, I mean, so good. I mean, he wasn't in this much, but just the, the difference between those two performances, I was like, rock on. I saw that movie. I don't remember anything about it. Is this a safe space to say that I don't love To Kill a Mockingbird as a book or a movie? Oh, sorry. It's my, <laughs> one of my favorites. Wow. Oh. 
<laughs> it's not very it's not a very popular opinion i mean I, it's good but i don't yeah i've never read the book never seen the movie so <laughs> i i liked him a lot as the uh police chief i thought he was great he had that sort of like tired police you know like bur- overburdened also very sweaty so yeah, sweaty everybody was so sweaty I remember him from Deep Space Nine. He played. Um, oh, he's so versatile. <laughs> yeah, he was Captain Cisco's father, so he owned a restaurant back on Earth. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> deep cut for Deep Space Nine. Um, <laughs> moving right along to like a lesser piece of furniture, I guess. Paula Kelly as Martha, who is Cad Fielding's whatever. I think she was personal. That she didn't come yes. up the building. Yeah. So. And yet they still called her furniture, which, mm-hmm. you know, again, that's the movie trying to say, look at how, you know, horribly unfeminist they are in 2022. Um, but uh, I feel like I, I also did not like the way they kind of set the audience up to really enjoy the sight of Charlton Heston, this white man beating the hell out of her mm-hmm. in that final scene. That was that was not OK with me um did you feel like they set it up for people to enjoy it or yeah because i, mean, I was, was kind of surprised by it i didn't i thought the violence was filmed in such a way that you're like yeah get her i mean it just it it because he's also beating up tab fielding and his very very punchable face which gets punched a lot and that was yeah. actually and i enjoyed that and i was like okay and she's <laughs> off to the side screaming and i'm like okay well she's screaming but then when he turns it on her and doesn't just get her out of the way, like, yeah, beats her up. I was like, uh, ooh, ooh. like, you could have gotten her, you know, removed her from the situation somehow. But that was a violent moment that was just like, and to me, that was that was the movie. That wasn't the theme of the movie. That was the movie. I didn't like that. I think again, it goes to the breakdown of society because even police violence is just it's expected and there's nothing you can really do about the, re- I mean, f- with recourse for it. So, I mean, cause he was able to do that just about anywhere in any scene that he wanted to. And the, the police could do, I mean, take whatever they want from crime scenes and from people. So it didn't, I mean, they had more power than people. So it was, I don't know. I just kind of thought it was more of a way of showing how, how much society has broken down. Yeah. I didn't have as strong reactions as you did there to, no, I don't. I don't agree with obviously any of it. Yeah. But I, I just took it in the frame of okay, I'm watching. I'm watching an alternative universe type thing. Yeah. Again, I don't know what that says. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly. Perhaps I'm burying my head into the sand and lots of things, but yeah. Um, and then our last two: Stephen Young as Gilbert the assassin. Oh, the just, young guy. Yeah. yeah, the young guy. Okay, with the, with the meat hook. With the. Meat. What they call a meat hook, but is probably a crowbar. It was weird that interaction with him and his and the 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 guy that he kills. Where he's like, "Is this good then?" Like, like he wasn't sure like about his actions. I guess again, that's another way of talking about how society is breaking down because he's just doing what he's told to do for money, and he's like, he's not sure if it's right or wrong. And so it, it was really weird. It was a very strange interaction. I mean, I assume it's a world where people will do anything for money because yeah. it is an ex- extremely short supply. So you probably yep. have to get rid of all of your morals and values in order to survive. Mm-hmm. Though, why anybody would want to survive in that world? I'd go to that. I'd go to that su- suicide parlor right now. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not interested. Usually, I try to figure out a way. Like when I'm watching dystopia, like I figure out a way of how would I survive? Or I'm watching, you know, The Walking Dead, and I'm like, okay, how would I survive? But this one, I was like, no, I'm not interested in doing that. <laughs> it's pretty bleak. Bleaker. Agreed. Agreed. I will Bleaker say, on a completely, you know, this is, uh, we, we saw mostly Gilbert when I was still kind of into this movie before I had like completely <laughs> checked out. Um, and I will say that he, he was sweaty and kind of, but he was, to me, he was the hottest person in the movie. I was yes. like, I hope we, I, I was kind of like, ooh, I hope we get to see more of Gilbert because he's cute. He um, is cute. I would agree with that. But he hit a bitter end. God, yes. That was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, uh, Eric, I mentioned him before, but Joseph Cotton as William R. Simonson, the man who starts this whole Michigas. Which I don't know if you guys recall, but Joseph Cotton was the dashing young policeman when we watched Gaslight. 
uh, way back from the 40s. Um, so he's like oh, a shit. Hollywood legend. Um, huh. And uh, yeah, really, really good actor. And I was just like, oh, Joseph Cotton's in this. And then like five minutes later, it's like, not anymore, he's not. Not anymore. Okay, that was a... So, he had a nice run. <laughs> yeah, Chuck just cashed in his Hollywood legend chips. And, you know, basically, probably said to Joseph, look, I'm doing this movie. Do you want to do two days of filming? Because sure. that's all you're going to need. Um, but yeah, there you go. He was good. He was good. As the... Uh, you know, assassination victim who went very willingly. Well, again, you know, I'm sure that once he realized the secret, he was like, I don't want anything to do with this. And, you know, but he, yes, did, he probably did. He was probably so entrenched. He, he was a billionaire with morals, which is how you know this is science fiction. <laughs> 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 but not morals enough to really like only until that point, only until he found out that Soyla grew was people. But like all the other bullshit he didn't care about. Yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah. People living on the streets and sleeping on stairwells, whatever. Let him eat cake. Right. You know? All good. I I live in Chelsea West. I live in the Chelsea Towers West. So yeah, I'm and I got good. a piece of furniture, so whatever. <laughs> Fuck y'all. Screw you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, moving on to dystopia, which is one of my favorite genres. Also probably doesn't say great things about me as a person, but... I love a dystopian novel. I love a dystopian movie, TV show, whatever. I love them all. Probably started when I read The Stand at like 13. Um, started that trajectory. <laughs> um, so I felt like ob- obvious things that we've talked about aside, that this movie wasn't like super far off uh, as how we are. We were in actually 2022. First of all, the face masks were very triggering, though they were wearing it for pollution purposes and not pandemic purposes, but definitely like... We were still wearing face masks in 2022. People are still wearing them in 23. I am not, um, but other people are. Uh, but they definitely hit some nails on the head, like certainly climate, obviously, like we're dealing with that mm-hmm. population-wise, capitalism and, you know, sort of companies taking over. So your thoughts? I was kind of surprised at that. I was like, yikes. <laughs> Especially the climate change all the all the references of climate change. Yes, and as we are recording this, the uh, the smoke from the Canadian wildfires is now like right over the Mid Atlantic mm-hmm. region, and I am feeling like, you know, I've I've taken three COVID tests because I'm like, am I coming down with something? No, I just feel oh, wow. shitty and I have a headache because I'm breathing smoke all the time. I mean, it's just you know, here we are. Um, so yeah, that was it was interesting. Uh, again, to yes, see everything they got right, and then all on top of this very 70s aesthetic, which I guess they thought was never going to change. But, you know, it's funny if you watch this movie, if you, if they didn't say what year it is, you might actually think that this happens, I don't know, is was supposed to happen in like, say, 2040 or 2050, because we seem to be on the trajectory to get to the point that this movie is going to be at. So, like, if they didn't say it happened in 2022, you could just believe it would be happening in the future because you kind of see where we're heading right now if we don't fucking fix our shit. So. How do you all feel about how the movies portrayed, like, the evils of people and sort of. I appreciated the fact that nobody was good. I mean, there was no knight in shining armor who was 100% Mm -hmm. good. Um, I was totally with the choice of the movie to have. Thorn steal a bunch of shit from Joseph Cotton's apartment because like, I don't feel bad for the dead billionaire who can't eat that onion anyway. And Edward G. Robinson really wants it. So like, to me, there's kind of like eh, morals, ethics, opportunity like that, that all worked for me. And yet it wasn't a buy the book thing to do. And I thought that was interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, I think they took the anti-hero thing a little far for me. Um, but I, I kind of enjoyed the idea that that this circumstance has forced everyone, as you said, Ali, to compromise their, you know, perfect morals because surviving is just, we have this innate need to live to see the next day. And sometimes that means doing things we're not very proud of. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that, you know, we talk now, 2023, a lot about you know, sort of the corporations that control the world and the people that control those corporations. And I, I thought that the company, the Soylent company, which by the way, I don't know why I didn't put this together, but Soylent is soybeans and lentils. 
Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that until I was doing my research. <laughs> Mind blown. Thank you. Right? right? Mind blown. <laughs> I was like, of course it's Soylent. Of course. <laughs> Soybeans and lentils. Right. Um, yeah, that really, that blew my mind too. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that that is, that is the case. And I think that's a lot of, you know, what we're up against now is, you know, the companies that kind of control the world or at least control America. And, you know, we try not to use Amazon or I try not to use Amazon, but sometimes Amazon is the only option for something that I'm going to need and I need it quickly. And, you know, I, I try not to buy books from there. You know, it's just, it's so it's hard. It's hard to, you know, we have to do a little compromising, I think, too. You know, obviously not in a swing the green sort of way, but. Well, and as, I mean, as companies continue to merge and get larger and mm-hmm. larger and larger, you're, you're going to see this as we get, as we move forward, unless we decide before companies merge, not after companies merge, that they shouldn't have merged in the first place. And so right. it's, since we're not really, I mean, sometimes we're good at it. A lot of times we're not. So, I mean, if, I feel like Europe is taking a bigger step towards actually protecting consumers when it comes to the merging and, and combination of companies than America is. So, I will just say I have no problem with billionaires. I just wish they paid their taxes. Um, <laughs> you know, if they and, did, then they would actually be doing society a lot of good. We could have, you know, uh, universal health care. Uh, we could make uh, our education system a lot better. We could take care of people at all levels of society. I don't think everyone needs to be a billionaire and there's always going to be Oprah and Jeff Bezos out there, but you know, uh, just pay your fucking taxes and I'm good. That's a spurious comment though, because they are paying their taxes. Otherwise I, the IRS would be after them. Everybody write your congressman and tell them to increase fucking taxes on billionaires so that they have to pay more. <laughs> it's not their fault. It's Congress's fault. Well, so. and, and not hide a bunch of money in the Cayman Islands. I mean, some of that, I, I, I don't think that these billionaires are also behaving perfectly. I think they're getting away with what we let them get away with. Um, but yes. Also true. Just pay um, your fair share and then I'm good. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, what is your favorite dystopian movie? Mine is Children of Men. Okay, so as I said, uh, the list is extremely long, but Children of Men is my favorite, not only for its famous, you know, like five minute long tracking shot, which is fucking brilliant if you haven't seen it, um, but just the movie is it's great. It's Clive Owen. It's Julianne Moore. It's, I mean, it's just, it's a crazy story. It's like a murky ending. All the things I love about a dystopian movie. What is yours, Eric? Um, well, we, we, we're, we're doing movies and not TV shows, so I won't talk too yes. much about either The Last of Us or The Handmaid's Tale, but I feel like, you know, some mention needs to be made because also they're so great. fucking good. Um, when I thought about favorite dystopian movie, I was like, do I have one? And then all of a sudden I remembered Never Let Me Go, um, which oh, the book, book is better. Too. The oh, book is better. Oh. The book is better because it saves the, like, twist to, like, the Correct. middle. And doesn't Correct. give it away at the very beginning. Um, so I wish the movie had done that too. Uh, but Carrie Mulligan uh, and Kira Knightley are so mm-hmm. good um, in the film. And if you don't know what it's about, um, it basically is, it takes place in this dystopian universe where they, they breed certain children uh, in labs and send them to school and they become carers and well, carers and also um, basically they're just farms for organs. So when people organ need an donors, organ transplant, you just go and, oh, we'll take a kidney from this one and a lung from this one. And until finally they need your heart or something and then you just die. Um, and so these these are actual human beings with human thoughts and feelings, but they know that their life is going to be short because they're going to have to donate some vital organ to a, a naturally reproduced person. Um, but it's done very quietly like it's not an action movie it's not what you typically think about as dystopia it's just what must it be like to be this person in that kind of society um and it's heartbreaking and i you know i know i'm yes. i'm weird i but i but i love it no that's a great yeah. one I, yeah, i've see, never seen the movie but i want to go it sounds interesting yeah see the movie but absolutely 100 percent read the book yes the book is is fantastic and that's uh-huh. a book actually maddie for your sci-fi book club and people, oh, would, yeah, for sure. people would hate it because for the first <laughs> half of the book, you're like, why did Matt make us read this book that's happening in this British boarding school that has nothing to do with science fiction? And then halfway through, you'd be like, oh, oh shit. Right. Yeah. 
Oops. Interesting. Okay. And we just ruined it for you. Okay. Sorry, but you know Sorry. that's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what's yours? Oh, uh, mine. So I went fun. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's dystopian. I think it's as dystopian as you can really get. I uh, Mad Max Fury Road. I love that film. So good. I want to go on the record as saying that is an awesome movie, and I am also fun, and I liked it, even though I didn't choose it as my favorite. It's awesome. I am also a very fun person, though I do like very serious dystopia. So, But that is a good-ass movie. I've seen it multiple times in the movie theater, and I, I wish that somebody would like rerun it in a the movie theater, because I feel like a movie like yes. that is hard to see. You know, you can watch it at home, obviously, but you need to see it on the big screen. Alamo you Draft did. House, it, if you're listening, first of all, sponsor us. Secondly, yes, we, yes, we want it. Mad Max Fury Road on the big screen. Yes. Do it. Yes, absolutely. Maybe when the uh, the new one comes out, they can do a double header. Yes, I did just see that Alamo is doing re- re-releasing Dune One and in, in uh, before Dune Two, like back in the theaters, and I was like, "How do I want to drive four hours to the Dallas Alamo to see a Dune One again <laughs> on the big screen?" I thought about it. But we'll see. Um, but Dune One was fucking good too. It's a good movie. You know what? Just that's plan good. a trip to DC while that's going on, Allie, and we'll just go to you know Rhode Island yeah. Avenue and, and we'll do go. It there. We'll go to uh, yeah. we'll go to Double Feature, Dune One, Dune Two. Yes, have burgers and beers while everyone screen. else is talking about spice. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll have some sort of like good, you know, like spice burger, spicy burger, <laughs> or some sort well, of like spice, blue. spice cake shake. <laughs> They have a thing um, at the Alamo menu now called the glazed and infused burger. And it took me a couple seconds before I was like, oh, dazed and confused. Got uh, it. That's the. Is it on a donut? Is that. No, the they they, they oh. glaze it with some kind of barbecue sauce and it's infused with like, there's like, it's a, kind of like a meatloaf. Like there's all the onion and tomato stuff is in the burger. Um, no, man. And it's kind of barbecue-y. But, you know, their main burger on their menu is called the Royale with cheese. So they're, they're very kind cinematic as, as they, they have good senses of humor people who make that they do. anyway i'm saying lots of nice things about the alamo because they really should give us money and put ads I, they should show. they should i'll talk more about their queso and their mat sticks which is what i usually get when i go <laughs> <laughs> um okay so I, honestly and maybe this is just me in writing this outline but like cannibalism is like no longer as shocking as it was. I'm sure it's very shocking in 1973. And again, people in 1973 and probably subsequently for several years were not spoiled. So they were like, Burr. and also one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes is To Serve Man. And at the end of To Serve Man, sorry, this is a 60 year old spoiler, but at the end of To Serve Man, they're translating a book that the aliens give them. And the guy's like, it's a cookbook. So it's kind of, <laughs> kind of the same thing. If you, to Serve Man, if you haven't seen it, definitely watch it it's a great great episode um but i just sort of feel like you know if you're a yellow jackets fan whatever like okay you know there was that movie with timothy chalamet where he and like his girlfriend were cannibals i forget what it was called did not really make a dent um something about bones bones and all or something bones bones and all something yeah something like that i don't know i just feel like cannibalism is just kind of like meh passe in 2020 for people (laughs) Oh, eating people. <laughs> Who hasn't done it, really? It doesn't Everyone feel does. shocking to me. I don't know. What about you guys? <laughs> I think it still shocks me because uh, it's just a disgusting thought. But I'll admit there's probably 10% of me that'd be like, what do we taste like? I don't know. <laughs> is that wrong? Like? <laughs> Are we taste like chicken or is it more like veal? I just kind of like it. I feel like we're red meat. I feel like we're red meat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did we go well with barbecue sauce? I mean. Um, <laughs> what doesn't? <laughs> I mean, again, I wish that I had been honestly shocked by the end of Soylent Green because I think. Me it too. Because it would have been such a curveball. Like cannibalism would not have been what I was expecting. No. Mm-hmm. And I think it would have been shocking. Um, I see what you're saying, Allie. It's not as shocking as a, as a cinematic device anymore. Correct. Um, you know, I mean, believe me, if I found out that my next door neighbor, you know, was eating their own version of Soylent Green, I would be mightily freaked out and it would be awfully shocking. But in the movies as a device, yeah, I mean, it's not okay. Well, that's kind of interesting. Like when you say that, cause like, you know, when Jeffrey Dahmer came on the scene and people found out what he was actually doing, mm-hmm. I mean, that was Fairly shocking. Very, but that was also animation. real. Like Jeffrey yeah, Dahmer. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I'm he saying. Wasn't like, True. He, whereas Hannibal in The Silence of the Lambs, that was creepy and weird, but it wasn't like, you know, it, ugh, it didn't give me nightmares, you know? Um, 
But yeah, yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer was a real dude and he was eating people and that was, was fucking people. gross. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Eric, I think you summed it up just right. Okay. <laughs> Um, so there is actually a meal replacement brand called Soylent. So like, it's not even serious anymore. <laughs> and, <laughs> Did they come out after this movie? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like 2013, I think. Um, it's like a tech startup. Why in yeah. the world would you call your company Soylent if you're selling food? Eat it. <laughs> I used to know nerd. somebody who ate it. Like they were like, I, I just don't have time to cook. So I eat a lot of Soylent. That is marketing. What's the opposite of genius? Whatever that is, it's marketing that. That's Oh, that's so stupid. Dumbass. <laughs> Doofus. That's a marketing dumbass move is what that is. Yeah. They're, I mean, I guess among meal replacement brands, they're pretty popular. I don't know. I mean, I think I would rather just, you know, I always would rather eat a hot meal than anything else. Like as far as I'll, I'll go like to a protein bar, but that's it. Like I'm not eating soy. I would not eat soy <laughs> on principle. I'm sorry. <laughs> What if we find out 10 years from now, though, that it actually is made from people? That it's an like, evil marketing genius move. <laughs> okay. Focus. Maybe, yeah, they're playing the long game. <laughs> Emphasis on evil. It's, it's a, a real long con. <laughs> <laughs> gross. Gross. So gross. Um, you know, obviously there's the famous line. This movie has a lot of, like, cultural staying power. Here are some examples. Um, in Judge Dredd. The deceased are recycled into food after they have the funeral. And that is a movie I've never seen. Um, A 2020 dystopian novel called Tender is the Flesh is where humans are farmed for their meat. Uh, A 2017 dystopian novel called An Excess Male is about a human overpopulation. It's very similar to Soylent Green. Uh, Logan's Run, another movie I've heard of but I've never seen, is a 1976 movie where the population and consumption of resources are maintained in equilibrium by killing everyone who reaches the age of 30. Those who try to escape are captured and frozen for food. Um, and then uh, I've always uh, wanted to see Logan's Run. I've never seen this movie, and yeah. it it was a big deal in the 70s, and I remembered it, and I I wasn't allowed to watch it because it was adult, and I figured it was yeah, no it was shit, too sexy. <laughs> I just, I mean, Farrah Fawcett was in it, and I, so I figured, okay, it must just be too sexy for my six-year-old self, but I think this is why my mom was not too keen on me saying Logan's Run. Yeah, um, and then there's a Dead Kennedy song um, called Soup is Good Food, which draws parallels between Soylent Green and modern America, so. Hmm. Long, long live Soylent Green. <laughs> okay. Um, are you all ready for some fun facts? Sure. Yes. <laughs> Um, I really had to tamp down the fun facts. There were a lot of options. Uh, the scene where Thorne and Roth share a meal of fresh food, which you've mentioned, the green onion, was not originally in the script, but was ad-libbed by Charlton Heston and Edward G. Robinson at director Richard Fleischer's request. Good job. That was a good scene. And I would have yeah. said that's a well-written scene. Yep. <laughs> had I not known it was not improvised. So Yeah. I, it didn't strike, like, didn't seem weird to me. It didn't, like, seem like it stuck out. Any of that. No, they knew their characters very well, and they spoke like their characters, and so that's yeah. that's you know. But it makes me like these screenwriters even less. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of the video game, the video game in Simonson's apartment, Computer Space, nineteen seventy one, was one of the first coin operated video games manufactured by Nutting Associates in nineteen seventy one and designed by Nolan Bushnell, who later founded Atari and designed Pong. The video game was painted white for the movie, but the original color was either yellow, red, or blue. So again, didn't even try to get futuristic, just took a video game on the market in the 70s and put it in a movie. Well, but also think of it this way. If it came out in 1971, there were not a lot of them around. So this might have been the first time a lot of people had actually seen a video game. So it would would have seemed futuristic to a lot of people. Sure. And in 2023, it made me chuckle a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I like how they, how they uh, designed it, like they painted it white for the movie. I like that too. Um, Lee Taylor Young, who played Cheryl, and Stephen Young, who played Gilbert, were the only stars of the film who lived to see the real 2022. Oh, wow. That seems right. I mean, yeah. they, were, they were the youngest. Yeah. And it was 50 years ago. 50 years ago. I mean, listen, you go back 50 years, a lot of the people who, uh, you know, we are talking about in these movies are probably no longer with us. It's true. Sure. Um, according to his 
this really, this, this cut me to the bone. According to the City of New York Police Department ID card, Detective Thorne was born on October 24th, 1980, making him 41 years old in 2022. So, younger than all of us. <laughs> in conclusion, younger than all of us. He did not look it, I'm just going to say. No, he did not look 41 years old, for sure. How old was like, Carl Heston, actually? That's, that's what I want to know. How old is he when they made this movie? Oh, I think late 50s, I would say. Yeah. I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I would hope. I would hope. The, the, the future rode you hard. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <laughs> rode you hard. Put you away, put sweaty. Away, put you away wet. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, all On right. The bed. Oh, he, so he was 50. He was born in 23. So. Okay. He's 50 years old. Um, all right, you guys, it's game time. <laughs> We're going to be playing a game called Soylent COVID. <laughs> so we're going to make a real, a movie featuring the real 2022 or really any of the years of the pandemics, which technically is still going on, but I would say 2020 between 2020 and 2022. So masks for COVID, not for pollution. Um, what aspect of the pandemic are you fo- focusing on? And if you are casting real people, who are you casting? Uh, Matt, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, I've, so I've, the aspect of COVID that really interests me was the way that where people absorb their information from and because of their life, like their perception of that information. And there's a lot of it, everything got political and sort of people started politicizing this. So even though people were given the same information, they viewed it very differently. So mm. I was going to do a generational story that happens right at the beginning. So three generations. Um, and I'm interested in this, you know, the tribal, the tribalism that happens around this. So I was going to start out with the oldest generation living in a kind of a suburban Republican area. And I was going to have um, the mom and dad played by Diane Keaton and Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, yeah. Have they ever been on screen together? That's a good combo. I think, yeah, I thought they would make, and they seem like, you know, just an older couple that yeah. probably en- might end up watching Fox News. And so like, you know, they're <laughs> getting their information from a certain area. Their local will probably put them in a Republican area, so which probably means that their local news is probably skewed a little bit more in a way that they mm-hmm. would produce information. Oh my God, they could, they could visit my parents for research. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people's parents that I know. So the next, and then I'm going to have two siblings. Um, so the middle generation are going to be moderate. One is going to be moderate Democrats. And so that's going to be played by Jason Bateman. And then Yan Yan Yo. Uh, she's a Malaysian actress. I don't know if you guys had just watched American Born Chinese on Disney+. Plus. I'm not, but I want to. It is a great, great series. It is based on a graphic novel, but it is, it is wonderful. Um, so she plays the mom in that show. And so I was going to put them together and then the youngest generation would be their child would be one of their children. So it'd be played by the son from that show, um, Jin Wong. So, you know, they're getting their news from a different location. The youngest generation, they're not watching news, Fox news, any of that. They're getting in their information completely from the internet and stuff in, in Twitter and our social media. Um, and then I'm also going to have another, the other brother who is going to be more right wing, but again, getting his information from other locations, played by Will Arnett and Aubrey Plaza is going to be his wife. It's a good couple too. Yeah. yeah. And then their daughter would be played by Sydney Taylor, who um, was also from American born Chinese. So I want to talk about our generational a general should show and what would end up, or a general should movie and what would end up happening is you would see the information that they are watching but the same information presented by the different feeds that they're getting Mm. their information Mm -hmm. from. And then their interaction as they are trying to discuss this with each other. I think, I think it would be make for a really interesting movie. It might be too much to do in a movie. So it might need to be a mini series. I kind of love my mini series. Now movies are great, but I kind of like, you know, six episodes of a show. So, (laughs) but that's the, that's the way I would go. And you know, Matt, you said before we we uh, we got online that you know I didn't put any real people in this, but I would totally put in clips of Sean Hannity and Tucker yes, Carlson absolutely. and Anderson Cooper. And I mean, I wouldn't necessarily bring those people to the set, but I would absolutely like pay to get those those you know news clips 
the know, rights to the news clips. Yes, because yes, I want what they actually said, and I and you know, and how that was all. It differs from the different person, so the presentation of the same information. And B roll of, of Anthony Fauci saying something, and then here's exactly. how Hannity presented that, and here's how yep. you know Rachel Maddow talked about it on her show, and yes. And how it pits the family against each other because mm-hmm. of what they're actually watching. Oh, that would be triggering for me. I don't know if I could. It's a little too close to my life. I'm not yeah. sure. Could, you know. <laughs> but Diane Keaton and uh, Tommy Lee Jones, I was sold. Because yeah, I would watch them sure. do anything. I love it. All right, Eric, what do you got? Okay, I think I'm still, like, my head is still in our uh, the game that we played last week. Um, all about a movie about the making of a movie. And... I was just struck by how during the pandemic, everyone else was locking down, but film sets were like running. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they, Hollywood did not stop making movies and TV shows. And so I was like, what is, I did a little research and I was like, what is a fun thing that we could, you know, it would be fun to watch the making of that actually had some problems during COVID and for a time shut down. And I figured that Ryan Murphy is such an egomaniac. He would probably play himself in a movie about the making of the prom. And anybody from Mm. that show, whether it was Meryl Streep or Nicole Kidman or Kerry Washington or Mary Kay Place or James Corden or anybody else who would be willing to, you know, play themselves, uh, we would make room for them uh, in the show. But it would just be about like what it's like to try to be creating this bubbly, frothy, entertainment in the middle of, you know, because when you're working on a film set during the height of COVID, you had to isolate yourself from everybody. Like you couldn't, you know, hang out with your family. It was just like, cut yourself off from the world, come to work, live in a literal bubble and, you know, live your life for this, this show. Um, and only take your mask off when you're doing a scene with somebody and the, everything behind the camera looks like, you know, uh, a, a scene from Soylent Green. So, um, I kind of thought, you know, it'd be fun uh, to do uh, something like that, or, you know, uh, make something up and just cast real actors as themselves and have the chance to kind of play themselves in that. But I thought the prom would be a good uh, maybe test case for, you know, how people who had to go to work, albeit in a much more glamorous industry than, you know, healthcare, um, how they dealt with just regular work, but in this very unusual time. I like it. Love it. Okay, so I, per usual, went in a totally different direction. I, uh, <laughs> I decided that we needed sort of a parody on all of Donald Trump's insane and inane press conferences in the year 2020 and just how they, you know, the injecting of the bleach and the radiation and the, you know, horse tranquilizer and whatever. Like, they just went, they just became more and more bananas so um, this is going to be a movie. It's going to be directed by Adam McKay, who knows himself a political parody movie. He Perfect. Ice, um, and lots of other things. And, um, you know, in a, in a world that didn't include rust, I would have cast Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump, but we are not doing that. Um, so we are going to do just, we're going to do a, a, a national talent search for somebody to play Donald Trump. Because um, I felt like, you know, all the people that tried to do it on Saturday Night Live were just sort of mid. So we're going to do a national search for a new comedian who's going to play Donald Trump. Um, and then I'm going to be casting uh, Fauci uh, with, <laughs> this is a little bit off, but so is this whole movie. So Steve Buscemi, Buscemi, Buscemi. Buscemi, Buscemi. I think. Buscemi. Um, so Steve Buscemi is going to be my Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, a little bit different. And then okay. my Deborah Burks, who of course, you know, was sort of like was a hot mess and, and resi- ended up resigning is going to be played by Christine Baranski. Perfect. So, oh my God. Yes. That is, that is brilliant casting. <laughs> so, you know, obviously there'll be lots of others, you know, I might have like Anderson Cooper and all of the people that you mentioned earlier make a, a cameo in the, in the movie, you know, at the press conferences and that sort of thing. But that, that is the, uh, that is my pandemic movie that's going to be made. Because look, we're, they're, they're coming. The pandemic books books have already come. They keep coming. I've read several. The pandemic movies are coming. So I honestly, Hollywood could call us for any of these. <laughs> right? I love it. Right. Okay. So we have reached the skip, red, or buy portion of our evening. Um, 
this means that we sort of evaluate the movie. If you're just turning in for, for Silent Green and you've never listened to a Rewind Project, uh, this is where we sort of evaluate what we would have done with this movie. Um, skip means I definitely am not going to be eating people. Rent means maybe I'll take a little nibble if I get hungry, you know, desperate times, etc. And buy means I'm ready to ready to slice it up. So reverse order, Eric, what are you today? Uh, in, a, in a shock to everyone who's listening, I am such a big old skip uh, for this movie. Um, there were things that were done well in it, and I'm not going to say that that's, un- that's not true, but I hated this lead character so much. I didn't give a shit what happened to him, and I already knew Soylent Green was people, so I just, there was, there was no good reason for me to, uh, to sit. I, to, ugh, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I saw it just because it is such an iconic thing, and now I can say I've seen it. Did I enjoy <laughs> it? No. Not so much. Um, okay, Matt. Uh, I'm actually a red. I watched the entire thing. I enjoyed the entire thing. Some of the scenes were difficult to watch and questionable, but I actually enjoyed the story, even knowing at the what you know what the end result was going to be. It was interesting to see how this entire breakdown of society tied together. So I actually I'm a rent. I, I think see it once. I am also a rent. I I enjoyed this movie. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that out loud, but I was like, that was a nice little tidy, you know, 90 minutes. We'd love to see that. You know, a nice tidy move, uh, science fiction dystopia movie, two of the things that I love. And, you know, I have long proclaimed my love to Charlton Heston, so that was exciting. And, yeah, I, I probably would never see it again, though I might. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, uh, it, was a, it was an enjoyable evening for me. Let's put it that way. Um, all right, so next up we have Mean Streets, which sounds like a new Greaser musical, but I know it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey Keitel sings. <laughs> <laughs> I would pay to see that. <laughs> all right, this has been the Rewind Project. I'm Allie. I'm Eric. I'm Matt. Be kind, rewind. You've been listening to the Rewind Project. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, and Google Play. Please subscribe and rate us. It helps a lot. We love your comments and questions. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and via our new phone number at 202-618-2402. Thanks for listening. Be kind. Rewind. Okay, that is the perfect ending for that cold open. Yeah. So right there, all that laughter fading into our. So, Allie, go ahead and take it away. Yep. <clears throat>